so welcome everyone uh, this week another webinar and I'm um, actually I've been excited all day because when we talked about it was Danny said okay we, we will learn a lot of things about a9 algorithm and the fake a10 uh, uh, is story and for me it's like it's super interesting we talk a lot about it and it's very difficult to know what's what's uh, true what's not true and um, hi Matt by the way, uh, and welcome everyone. That's super exciting. For those who've been in, in this webinar a couple of times, we, you know, I like to start to break the ice with a fun fact. And I think, Danny, you've got a nice fun fact. All right. So, yeah, what a fun fact that no one knows about me. Um, so, I think I was maybe 16. I end up taking a job in a fish slicing factory, and I lasted all of a week. Uh, you're up at four o'clock. I think it's five thirty-six start, but you're up at four a.m. And the first thing in the morning, you've got like these ice-filled tubs where you're cleaning down the fish, which was salmon, and so they have to be sliced and packed. So you've got your yeah, hands in ice cold water, and of course it's salmon. And then it's like a production line that you stand on, net on your hair, gloves, you know, the the regular stuff for health and hygiene, and that's all you're doing all day. Packing, moving on, packing, moving on. It was the most demoralizing job in the world. And the worst part of it was getting on the bus after work and um, going home and being on the bus and stinking of salmon and like people parting like the Red Sea. And uh, as I said, I lasted a week and uh, I made up that I had a sister because what the company said is like it's optional overtime. Well, trust me. By the time you're in there, 6, 6.30, whatever it was, and it's 4 p.m., then seconds and minutes were so slow. And it was like you're ready to race out the door. And as you're, like, packing down your desk, he's like, where are you going? It's 4 o'clock, going home. Get back to your station. I thought you said this is optional. It is. Well, I've got my sister to pick up. So I managed to get through there because you just don't want it. It's just too painful. And uh, But back then, you know, the money was really good. And now I know why, because uh, – Literally, it was uh, horrifying. I'm still kind of traumatized by it now. Yeah, no, if I understand well, you can't eat salmon, so a week of <laughs> costs you like that. So, but it, 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 I think it's great to have people who've who've been into hard work because you kind of appreciate having a work where you enjoy what you're doing. So, thanks. But actually, it's a bit of it's a fun fact, but it's also a bit. We feel sorry for you, but that's okay. You're, you're doing very well today. Well, we just, I, I just, <laughs> I'd done anything to get away from doing jobs like that. You know, it's like even at that age, um, I'm like coming up to 46, but even that age, because I went into the music industry. Um, so I'd done some laboring jobs and things like that, but I was quite lucky because I've had two to three turns in my career now with like with Amazon and commerce. So I'd done music industry, then into tech and from tech into online in terms of websites then into marketplaces of Amazon. So I've been quite lucky that way, but I'm not being very good at holding down jobs that I hate. I couldn't it just, just soul destroying, you know? Well done. So that's a story for, for uh, I'll tell that to my kids. Yeah. Yeah. About, you know, not working at school. Well, they all want to be influencers um, now, don't they? They don't want jobs. It's like you won't get them to do it. Most people nowadays, but you won't get them to do that. Like them kind of manual label, uh, kind of job but yeah sorry go on exactly um but let, let's so uh, a less fun fact about you who you are and, and about your company so um <clears throat> obviously on the webinar it says uh data brill but i i started as a seller on amazon in 2015 then 2017 i launched seller sessions the podcast and 2000 by the you know i started to travel around as a speaker and stuff as well off the back of the podcast and then i think it was 2019 i did um set the first seller sessions live I think it was 19 or 20 and also the first seller poll seller poll is going on now so it's in year three we've done two sold out seller session shows once a year we had to move through covid uh 2018 i i set up data brew with dr ellis whitehead he's a former engineer over at jungle scout he worked on the original jungle scout algorithm so he's an algorithm expert and a data scientist so we've been running uh data brew for the last three years and still going each year we have seller poll awards then seller sessions live and branded by women so the next brand Branded by Women 3, or it's going to be in May. Um, 
yeah, that's about it. There's lots of going on, but there's the core of the stuff. That's amazing. So you might understand that Danny likes to do stuff and do a lot of stuff. So today, as I said, our big topic is talking about the Amazon algorithm and, and diving into it and getting some more understanding. So today, unlike other sessions, because it's technical, we will have a few slides that uh, Danny will present. So you can share your slides whenever you want, Danny, and, and get going on that. Yeah, let me just pull my slides up one second to make sure they're on the right. Because we, we're doing that also at the podcast. So for people who are listening yeah. to us on the podcast, we will be explaining what we see. So that will be an entertaining and right. exercise for us. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I just had to get into presentation mode and now I will share my screen. Okay. So let me know if you can see that. I do. Excellent. All right. So first things first, send in a glass eye to sleep. Why do I say that? Well, outside of people, I'm not an engineer, right? But I sat down with a few engineers to help me digest this information because effectively what I've got is I've taken the original A9 science literature that I, I, I came across on the web. And I also used A9 uh, from the A9 team, Dorica Sonica, I think her name is. It's The Art of Ranking, came out in 2016. You can find it on YouTube now. So what I try to do is take the scientific approach because we're common that people would use observations and they go, yeah, you know, there's an update here. and But no one really knew what the, the hunger score is. No one knew what uh, positive and negative labels are. And so what I wanted to be able to do is like, how can I open source this information because you've got to remember it's the science literature and so you take that information you extrapolate it and one of the hardest things to do is to break that information down so it's palatable for an everyday seller now some of the stuff will get confusing and so the biggest job i had on my hand was to translate from engineers back into what we say let's say understandable english because most people won't get it. So, and you need to be able to put it together in such a way that, okay, so now you told me what it is and you've extrapolated us research papers and videos. How do we use it now? Does it benefit us? So that was where the sending the glass eye to sleep part comes into. And if I can jump in, one question is that a lot of people say that, and we know that Amazon is a bit secretive, right? And you don't, mm -hmm. nobody knows really what's, what's happening inside. Like, so you're saying that there's a way of looking at it from external research and which yeah. can give us insight about what's happening on Amazon. Is that correct? Yeah, I went on to uh, Amazon.science. I went on to the video, The Joy of Ranking. I followed back on that Joy of Ranking for some science literature that was released to the audience in 2016 at the conference that was taken from. So it's like piecing all of that information together. It's not secret data. It has been put out there, but people just hadn't either come across it or wasn't interested in digesting it. Because I suppose in some cases, it's not as sexy as saying, yeah, all you need is to use this URL and you'll go right to the top and then do these three things and this hack and everything else. I don't do that stuff. So yeah. for me, it was like, take it, this was kind of a big-ish project because the, the, the key thing is, how do you make it palatable? Yeah, so it took some time to put Honestly. it together. So hopefully we'll get some stuff on, and what I'll do is I'll give context to this and I'll use quotes from the A9 team from this documentation as well. Yeah. And then what okay, we'll do is great. we'll get into PPC ranking. Uh, now we've got that background. Yeah. And then we'll go in and out to taper off and stuff like that. So I want to make sure that the session is uh, palatable in a way that you can utilize this on your own business as well. Yeah. Yeah. Great. All right. So just just start off with a few facts here. So according to Amazon's own data, 70% of Amazon customers never click past the first page of search results, right? 35% of Amazon shoppers click on the first product featured on the search page. The first three items displayed in search results to account for 64% of the clicks. So let's just stop there for one moment. What is that just told you? If you're, especially if you're on a desktop, Amazon's turned PPC into a pay-to-play pay because they have the data so they know where all the clicks are heading. So they've monetized those clicks and pushed organic results down and quite often below the fold, depending on how many top ads and what platform that 
it's uh, it's been displayed on. Yeah, whether it's an iPad, desktop, Mac, PVC, you know. So this is yeah. really key to understand is like anything off page one is dead. And this is why quite often that you see that people can rank to get to the top of, you know, the bottom of page one, 15, 16. They'll come up from the gods, 365. They'll do a couple of giveaways or whatever way the mechanics they've worked it in terms of ranking it, yeah? And it just flies up and then it gets stuck. Why? Because all the sales are at the top half of page one. Like it said there, 64% of clicks is the first three items. 80% or 82% don't normally go off page one. So you're in the abyss effectively. You're in the Amazon jungle unless you're on page one. And Amazon hey. made a good job of, uh, of optimizing to return as much money as possible by pushing down the organic results and taking pay-per-click uh, pay clicks. Yeah. Yeah, I remember reading a comment from someone. I can't remember the name. I'm sorry. He said it's the best, uh, the best place to hide a, a dead body is on page uh, two of yeah. the Amazon. Or Google. Yeah, that's a Google uh, thing as well, wasn't it? So this is yeah. a the search engine journal. This is the source here. And again, look, 81% of the clicks are on brands on the first page of search results. So 19% off page one. Now, once you spread that across dozens of pages, you know, we're talking about single digit sales, one here, two here. Yeah. So that's why it's quite easy to rank from back in the gods and get up to 15, 16 and into the top 10 on not super high velocity. You know, like if we start talking yeah. about dog chews and stuff in the US, you're going to need to do more sales. But just generally speaking across the platform, you know that outside of page one is quite easy to get there through giveaways, etc. Right, so the A9 algorithm. So you see this little uh, GIF at the top here. There was a uh, seller, an Asian seller sent that to me. And effectively, because A9.com, I think he's been taken offline. So he looked through Google history and he pulled that up there. So it gives you an understanding of why it's called A9. Because A1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Yeah. So there's a little fun fact there. But the key thing is here is this nonsense about A10. And A10 doesn't exist right so amazon search powers the most most of its sales right small improvements in relevance can positively impact millions of shoppers right so a10 does not exist in any of the science literature it's only in blog posts of people and people talking about it from said blog posts yeah but, but what, what triggered this A10? Because I remember, I think it was this year where people said, ah, oh, no, it's been about three years ago. What happens okay. every year someone comes along, they, they, they read that original blog post from about two or three years ago, and then they rewrite the post because they're thinking, oh, that's good. You know, maybe they're looking to seed it in, in Google or try and get some interest around their product or service. I mean, I've even okay. seen uh, one, once, uh, one or two ranking companies going back a year posting that and it's like well you, you're a ranking service you've got to be a bit careful here you should know about ranking and it, and it doesn't exist because a lot of stuff as we know it can be theory and it could be someone shares something on a on a facebook group and then suddenly it becomes the gospel when it's not yeah, yeah? it's the well-known fake news that uh, one thing is uh, uh, oh one thing we we had a feeling that some things had evolved and I think whatever the name of that, for example, outside um, traffic had a larger impact than it had in the past. Okay, using, for example, Facebook or Google, advertising yeah. sending into Amazon had a, like a, a more of a boost effect than, than we yeah, saw. Yeah, it's called a halo. It's always very, yeah. yeah. Well, an over, overflow or halo effect. I mean, if you look at Casey Goss, former guy from Viral Launch, generated billions in terms of launches for, for customers. He's now head of search at Frasio and they've got tremendous amount of data because they've got over a hundred brands, right? So when they were sending external traffic to their websites and they were bouncing off to go to Amazon because they'll go, oh yeah, I'll rather buy it on Amazon because my checkout credentials is already there. I have Prime and everything else. They were getting the what's called an overspill and then taking on what some people call like the halo effect because you've sent for third-party traffic or external traffic to the platform here's the irony there isn't really any there isn't internal traffic or external traffic we call it a labels external traffic 
all the traffic comes from outside to land on Amazon. Yeah, but you, you, you would have a generally when we would say external traffic is an advertising would get you directly to the page to buy it directly. Let's what say, I mean is, and is the is internal that, would be, yeah. Yeah. So everyone, if they buy on Amazon, they start externally and until they go internally. But what we understand we use that to differentiate from the traffic that will say we send or a third party sends, because that's the language we understand. But an engineer sat me down the other day. He says, you do realize that uh, there's no such thing as external or internal traffic. It's, it's all external. And it's just pedantic information, but it, it's true, right? Uh, I think what it is, is that you're using internal advertising resources, sponsored products, etc., or external advertising resources to to in order to get the click to the purchase do you see what i mean yeah i do the, but the, it's like the the idea was like did, did you see this that uh, i've like the impact of okay what we call external traffic let's say google led or facebook led advertising directly to uh web pages did you see that it had it in, the impact increased or is it just a view? Yeah, of, see, with... see, what I think it's more about the volume. And obviously, not everyone's sitting down and making these experiments and tests. So they're a rigid experiment. They're just going, yeah, I'll send a bit of Google traffic. And there could be so many different variables. Oh, look, I've got some sales. And it may not be that traffic unless you're able to bind the keywords to, you know, your attribution reports, which can be a bit tricky and stuff like that. So there's gaps in the reports. But the feeling is Amazon likes that traffic and those with the biggest data tend to see the correlation more so than someone who's just got one product that they're sending traffic on two keywords from using Google ads as an example. Yeah. Okay. So in the early days, the search engine consisted of hand chewed ranking functions with automation, of course. So we're going back to, I think, well, much has changed 2016. If we go back there, hand tuned ranking functions, we're not going back that far, right? So Amazon has the opportunity to make these adjustments to this day. So when we see these pushed updates and things like that, everyone's seeing it through their own lens in a different way. And I'll get into this stuff in a bit. But a lot of this is based around behavioral features, right? So example, hundreds of products can be similar and equally relevant, but some are more popular than others. Going back as far as 2016, Amazon is using 100 machine learning models. Today, we just we don't know because we don't have any literature to say how many they are now using. So this is a quote from Amazon. Across the Amazon platforms, they're managing different catalogs, indexes, and ranking models. Yes, not all markets are built the same in terms of ranking and search relevance. What that means is, is a lot of people just think there's one A9, you push an update, right? And it updates everywhere, and it doesn't. These are all individualized tests I'll get into in a sec, right? So with the, they're called ranking models. Within that, uh, data is collected from products, including sales and reviews. Training data is collected from customer behavioral logs, right? Going back to behavior. To quote, we use search to collect our training sets. Several times per day, we compute the unique set of keywords issued for each context of interest. The context can be the combination of marketplace category and some of the user features. These include context of query, textual similarity related to said query, and customer status. This is why behavioral what features. What is customer status? Sorry. I'm still what is trying to. Status? Yeah, I'm still trying to work out what this is. Now, what I do know, it's not customer quality score. And that's been a myth okay. that's been perpetuated, which is a story for another day. Customer status, there is not enough uh, context to that it's information not. because there, no one put any skin in the game to cover that in, in the science literature. Okay. It just, as a quote, I think it's Dorian Sonica said that in her video when she mentioned customer status. She was listing items, but without context. Okay. This is why behavioral features drive the rankings. Users tend to click more often on results at the top of the search results page. So relevance, um, relevance observed click-through rate. I'm gonna break this down for you in a moment. So to quote, since the most relevant products appear higher in the ranking, the observed click-through rate at a given position captures not only the position bias, but also the typical relevance of this position. 
So what does that mean? The position bias means that you have a higher click-through rate at the top before fewer and fewer people click to stick around and click on items further down. And relevance, so being higher on the page, means that you tend to have a higher click-through rate than a lower-placed item, even if the lower-placed item is more relevant. You could read that in multitude of ways, right? One of them could be price. So you could have a product that is relevant, and you've got a product that's super relevant, but more expensive, but it makes more sales. Therefore, it's at the top of the page. Therefore, the adjustment there to be a higher click-through rate on average as most people, going back to the search engine journal data earlier on, the click through, the clicks on the first three products are key of 64%. And ICO is also as a habit of being someone who's used to buy on Amazon. At some point, you know that, okay, the product after the advertising, and yeah. just because you say, okay, it's advertised. And if you're used to it, you just go, oh, the first, the second, or the third, probably other one of those three will, will be okay, right? And by habit, you don't really question, you, you just assume that, even when you know Amazon, you just assume that's probably the best one for yeah. my type of, uh, uh, as a customer, right? So, and you get yeah. used to it. So it's 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 a chicken and egg kind of uh, like thing where, okay, you're getting used to it and then you're not questioning it again, yeah. questioning it. So it's a go on selling. Yeah, right. indeed. So to quote, a single ranking model usually covers a combination of category in the marketplace as mentioned before, example, books in Japan. For training the ranking models, we use labels based on customer actions, such as purchases, add to basket, which is add to cart, or clicks. So we all talk about add to cart because people use that as a way of manipulation, if you like, although that add to cart uh, as a technique does not appear in the verbiage of the terms of service, but it could one day, right? So what these matching products and queries uh, sum down to is positive labels and negative labels. So positive labels would be click, add to cart, purchased. If it's a digital product to be consumed, so digital categories such as Kindle, Amazon Music, effectively you can measure start times, end times, how many times they watched it and everything else. But you can't measure someone buying a can of Coca-Cola and seeing you drinking it as an experience in terms of the consume side, right? Then what is really important is the negative labels, which is also toned as uh, ignored results. Product was not shown, no action was taken. If the customer is on the results page, picks number three, then number one and two have a negative vote attribution. Not that the product's negative, but it's the way that it works it through the system in terms of whether it's machine learning or however they do it, is that it's, Amazon is very... Uh, clear on measuring both the positive and the negative and it goes back to people that let's just say you're sending outside bot traffic and it's hitting the page but they're not doing anything they're not moving on etc etc so when you start to think about conversion rate which we'll get into a bit later and the impact that that plot the role plays and the hunger score negative and positive labels play a massive massive role and we have to think about this when we're doing copywriting, our videos, our images, and everything else, which I'll get into. These are needed for future proofing as bad experiences in return search results to the end user on the platform. Validation traffic is constructed from several days of customer traffic. So there's another part of the, of the uh, let me just take it back. So the validation traffic, we're still talking here about the ranking models that are trained, yeah? And as we move in, we're now talking about a blended score. So it comes down in it like a tree formation. I'm not sure of the exact order that it runs in. So they blend the score, right? So they're, they're talking about the query itself and giving it a query category score for common queries. So for instance, the counter clicks, add to carts and purchases. So we keep hearing add to carts, right? So add to carts is obviously what we're going to call a con conversion on the continuum, which I'll get into in a little while. So the components of the blended score, this is calculated on user behavior information, if we've mentioned, and how often the customer interacts with the category post-current search query. So a lot of shoppers will be very particular about where they go on Amazon. They might get their shopping or their pet food, or they might buy clothes on Amazon and everything else. So Amazon wants to see how they interact within the same category and what they do post the first current 
search query before purchasing or moving on to another query on the platform to purchase again. So when we look at uh, indexing problems that people have, and so keywords are not showing. So categories and subcategories are playing a big role in what we do. And you notice that we, in some cases, some keywords just won't index in certain categories or subcategories, which comes back to the point of relevance. Now, if we get into queries, you're getting a bit more technical here. You've got unigrams, one word, big grams, two adjacent words, trigram, three adjacent words, and four grams, which is four adjacent words. So these are normally long as parts of long queries are statistically challenged. What that means is, so if an average search term is two, three words, right? And they end up being much more regular, even if they're not running in the same order, those three words or those two words, the chances are they're gonna be much more regular than a search string of six words. And why they say that is when you need to reach statistical significance, let's just say that search string of six, regardless of the order those, those individual words are placed, the chances of measuring that data correctly over a year when you've got all the different seasonality, it becomes a challenge for them to manage those longer queries with less usage on them and how they can make use of those queries in terms of their programming. And the order, the, the order of the words themselves, do they have an impact or the system doesn't really care, like, if you, uh, you know? Of course, you know, you've got your, your matches in terms of, like, you wouldn't say oil beard and beard oil. There's going to be more people saying beard oil versus oil beard, but they're still going to be relevant in some ways, just the order of the words are different. What I'm talking about is if you're talking about search strings of six, the orders of those and the fact that they're irregular and done different periods of the year, like Q4, the summer, just after Christmas when refunds and stuff come in. It's more statistically challenged for them in order to utilize that data in a, in a good flow of common path. Yeah, I was trying to think about a, a keyword with, or like a keyword phrase with six words. And I, That's what I'm saying. Know. There's not many of them, right? I'm, yeah. I'm over overcooking the six words because of what I'm trying to present is that the, okay, let's just say that um, we say we're at the agency and we're running a PPC uh, account for, we're doing the PPC on a seven figure brand, right? But what happens is they get loads of long tail keywords rather than having what we call head tail keywords it's not easy to measure that data because let's just say that some accounts might have 30 keywords, but they do a lot of sounds sales on 80, 20 rule, you know, so they might get 400 sales on one, a thousand sales on another, 200 another. And as it starts to go down, but some accounts might have five or 600 keywords that change in all the time of long tail. So it makes it more statistically challenged in terms of looking at those periods over time. One, there's so many of them. Two, they become a rare occur occurrence. And three, the amount of sales that are, uh, are, uh, on those keywords are quite low because it's very hard to make any informed decisions on, on keywords with sales of less than 10 to find some common path or common ground there, yeah? Yeah, okay. So hunger score. This is quite complicated to understand, and I'll try and go... Uh, I'll give you an analogy that was used in the video. So the longer the category is not chosen, the hungrier it becomes. The higher the category's uh, query score, the faster the category gets hungry. This is a dynamic score that ch changes during the blended process. When nothing is chosen from a certain category, the hunger score becomes higher and important categories become hungrier faster. So in category score relevance for each product, the more relevant products are more likely to get chosen and scores from different models, those ranking models, need to be comparable to each other. So let's have a look at a demo, uh, demo of how it works. So with this broken down, the top items for those listening back on the podcast, you've got a column that is item name, then you've got a score for in-category relevant score, you've got hunger score, and then you've got rank. And what we're using is we're using three different examples. P stands for pet products, M for movies and U for music albums. So initially the hunger score is set to zero for everyone, right? And you can see in the in-category relevant score, P1 has 1.9 in relevance, giving it a rank of one. Now, 
Product one is the highest in category relevant score, which is chosen the rank of one. And then since movies have a higher quality category score than music albums, it's hungrier, it, it's hunger increases faster. So if we go down to the category score now, you can see in number two is M1, which is for movies, and it's 1.6, giving it a hunger score of two and a rank of two. And then you've got U1, which is the uh, albums, Oh, let's take it back, which is the albums puts the hunger score as one, but it's not been denoted yet as given a rank. So this is a system that will run through, run through, run through. And to give you an example is what the lady from A9 used was, it was a few years ago, but Harry Potter might have been a book or a movie. It might have been the second, the third. I can't remember exactly. And so... We have a thing in, in our community, as we describe it, is the honeymoon period where the product floats up, yeah? So if you think as the hunger score, it's trying to turn over products that may be of interest to people and float them to the top, yeah? And we call that the like honeymoon a bit like a booster. Like yeah, a, a bit booster. like a booster, yeah. Yeah. Giving and, it a chance. Yeah, and she, she, she mentioned as a joke that, you know, when our algorithm is not working is when the business team contacts you. And you have to make manual adjustments because if you think when you're launching a product, they have to get around the problem of a, of a hard start. So starting from zero, how are people going to discover these products? Well, this is why they're using the hunger score. The hunger score is going to be utilized of finding products in and around the current top products to see if it can give these other products some activity from a zero start. So in summary, what have we learned? There's no such thing as an A as A10. Machine learning plays a massive role and nearly all activity happens on page one. Ranking models are not the same on each marketplace. As I said, they have their different training sets run by different teams, so updates are done independently. And behavioral features drive the rankings. A blended score is used, which is counter clicks, add to cart and purchases, which suggests add to cart seems to be the largest signal on the conversion continuum. Can I can I hold it for a second? It's like, yeah, there's a lot of people who add products to carts, and we know, you know, for Christmas lists and so on. And just as a reminder, would, would never buys. So you would you would say that the system will still give this add to cart thing a high, a high rating in terms of ranking. Is that? Well, well you got you got the probably. subsets of inside, right? If you've got two equal products selling at the same, you know, same amount of units, where do you add? You place them. Well, it's the impact on the conversion continuum, the activity on the page, the time on site, the clicks, and everything, which I'll get into in the next bit. Okay. Right. So, don't make this mistake. Nearly all search terms that do not appear in the brand analytics report have ten or less searches per day. Of course, there are exceptions to the rule. What do I mean by that? When you're using the third party tools outside the new Explorer, yeah, third party independent tools are guessing using an algorithm how many, uh, how much search volume there is, yeah. But with Ellis and his team and a few other engineers, they discovered, and this is based on the US platform, that effectively anything that doesn't appear inside the brand analytics report has 10 searches or less per day. And when you get to Europe, it's lower. So if you can imagine um, what you need to do is if you run a, in a tour and you've got a hundred search terms, you think, brilliant, you know, like I've got plenty of opportunity here and wash that against brand analytics. You might actually find that there's only five or 10 in there that are worth going after. So it gives you a false sense of security when launching new products, because you're using tools that guess that information. So there's a good like barometer there, is just check your keywords that you're running in third party tools against the brand analytics report. And now of course, you've got the Explorer tool. So let's get into ranking with Amazon PPC. So if your PPC is a competitive conversion rate and generates enough orders, it would definitely boost your organic ranking. So in this graphic we've got up on the screen here, each bar represents one week of data and is eight weeks, 
eight lines on each block of data here. Yeah. So in the left column, we see the average organic rank where the smallest bars show rank one is as good as you're going to get because it's come from up down to position number one. You can see that the rank moves quickly towards rank one over the first month, as you can see here on all of these. That one, not so, but the top two, you see a steady climb going in a downwards motion, going from up to down into position one and the middle one here in position two. In the remaining columns, we see impressions, orders and spend. These are mostly trending upwards and possibly plateauing after the first month. So you see the impressions going up, going up, going up. And you can see the orders are climbing up as it goes down in rank to one. More impression share is being created here. More orders are being purchased off the back of it. And obviously you've got the spend column. That gives you an idea there, right? So how do you do this yourself? You do this, uh, you know, at your office outside of using an agency, et cetera. So your listing should be very well optimized. This conversion rate plays a massive factor in success. Has a bad conversion rate become a hindrance to your organic rank? A9 uses negative and positive labels, as we mentioned earlier on, right? And this is the bit where we get into conversion works on a continuum. The algorithm is a multifaceted view of a conversion rather than what we read as a sale. When your customer clicks on your product, you're effectively getting a micro conversion credit on that query. If the customer spends time on your product page and does not bounce off, you're getting another micro conversion. The more time spent on the page in principle, the higher the engagement. When a customer adds the product to car, again, that produces another positive signal. Amazon uses this as a strong signal in the continuum as a conversion. Whilst it's very basic breakdown, you can see why the conversion process is on a continuum rather than a static object. So we look at the final sale. What we should be looking at is also the level of engagement in and around the product. So we, we use like, when we think about writing listings, we think of the copywriting, we think of the images, videos, and and etc. Right. So you've got your title, your bullet points, back end, description, uh, A plus, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But if you think of it as another way, is like, how do I make sure to maintain this engagement on the page above and beyond of just seeing this as a flat vector? Think about when you're optimizing your listing, think about in a 3D image. Yeah because you wanna make sure your engagement high, you want people to scroll up and down, you want people to click on the images because your listing is being compared to everything else. So the positions have got to work on the micro adjustments in between to give the, the ranking position, yeah? And by doing so, if you've got higher engagement versus somebody bounced off a page, that's gonna position you better for, for ranking because you've, you're hitting certain paths within the continuum the conversion continuum path. And that gives you a good reason to have engaging or like interesting content because people yes. will stay longer on your page and that's a micro conversion rate. Right? So that goes yeah. Yeah. into continuum. Yeah, we're getting into micros here, but it's those little details that make all the difference. And it's the way we look at stuff is important. Yeah. As I said, we look at listing optimization. Imagine that's like a flat vector. But what I've just said there with negative and positive labels, conversion on the continuum, you're now starting to look at 3D, yeah? You're looking at different dimensions in terms of how you're putting these together. So the idea is set up, one keyword, one ASIN, one campaign. Isolating like this means we can measure top of search on a granular level. For sponsored products, top of search placement statistics are on a campaign level. The ranking algorithm compares uh, uh, different factors. Here are two of them in terms of the ad placement algorithm. We're in PPC now, so we don't get confused. You've got your order history and your conversion rate for a specific product listing and the said keyword. This is then compared to all of your competitors on the same keyword. If you get a higher conversion rate through PPC sales, then you are gaining points on both of those metrics. And what we've seen in-house, the relevance will get you'll get a relevant boost from this. Now, moving into problems ranking high velocity products. A lot of people struggle with this. 
This comes back to rank, the ranking algo. There are only so many ad positions which are placements worthy of eyeballs on page one, right? So for a high velocity keyword with established ASINs that are already converting, it can still be very difficult to break in and get any impressions, even with a phenomenal conversion rate. This is why you hear people bidding 20, bu uh, 20 bucks a click without getting any impressions at all. So depending on your stamina, and if you keep going over time, Amazon's algo might give determine to favor your campaign here, but there's no telling how long this will be. It could be that one of your competitors go out of stock and effectively you slot into that position, but there's no ways and ways to control this. Again, which could give you a nice booster. So what is the answer? Is there a special calculation? Well, the answer is yes, no, and some common sense. So what we've laid out here, Ellis designed this out as a, a layout. So for people listening back on the podcast who can't see the screen. So K1 is keyword one and K2 is keyword two. P1, P2, P3 on keyword one are the placement positions, right? And then you've got keyword two, placement one, placement two, placement three, and placement four. So I've exaggerated the numbers here to give you a good example. So let's just say that you want to go after a keyword, but in position one, that does a thousand units a day, and you're trying to rank with PPC. It's, it's, it's literally impossible to do the money you need to spend based on an expressed conversion rate. But then you look at position two and you go, okay, on, on position two on keyword one, which is the high velocity keyword, do 500 units a day. Still too far off. Position three, 250 units. But then if you move to keyword two, you can say, okay, this is more of a mid tail keyword. Position one, 50 units a day. Still quite hard, right? Then position two is 25. Then position three is 10. And you go, oh, look at this. Position number four. All I've got to do is get five or six units a day, right? Based on uh, a top of search placement with an average conversion rate or estimated conversion rate at 20%. That's your low hanging fruit. So instead of going after keyword one, so let's just say we had keyword two, uh, two was organic beard oil. Just to give you an example, just for reference, not, not that it is. So keyword two is organic beard oil, but keyword one is beard oil. So you can actually start by getting some relevant factor and going the low hanging fruit for sales on organic beard oil if you sell organic beard oil before you upgrade to try and play with the big boys of beard oil, right? Because you're already using two words out the phrase anyway. And that's going to be easier to you also to get impressions, lower sales per day. And if you come from a cold start, it's going to be a lot easier to deal with, even though you need to get in some order history in there. So if we were just, to, sorry. Yeah, just to understand, well, position one, position two is like position on the pages, right? It's saying, yes. okay, top yeah. of the page, side of the page. So it's like what you're saying is typically when you're in a very complicated category, very, very competitive, that you say, okay, we've seen that the placement number four, which could be, you know, on the lower part of the page, you need to sell at least five a day. Yeah. To, so that the algorithm picks you up and says, okay, that's a good, that's a good product. Is that? No, what I'm saying what is instead of trying to target really competitive keywords that are going to cost you, you know, if they're doing 50 units or 100 units or 1,000 units a day, how are you, which I'm going to get into the calculation in a minute, how are you going to expect to sell that many units? Because the whole idea is that you're using PPC to organically rank, but you just simply can't get there on the numbers and the cost. You can't keep up with it because you've got no sales history. You're starting from back right so on the screen here to get to position number four going back to that first keyword right yeah, yeah. so let's just say you want to go for keyword two and you know you've got to get five orders a day so to get to position four you might aim for at least five orders a day if your conversion rate is 20 percent, then that may mean five orders divided by conversion rate is equal to 25 clicks then if your cost per click is $5 for that position, it will cost you $5 divided by conversion rate, which is equal to $25 per acquisition on average or $125 a day, which comes back to the point of gaining impression share and the cost of running very expensive top of search campaigns. And usually a market that's red hot, generally with a higher cost per click, 
So how do we launch PPC and then taper off knowing where our numbers land or break even, right? So now we worked out our low hanging fruit. We've worked out our keywords, but how do we dial this in? Because you're going to, at some point, going to need to take it into break even if you're going in the red, yeah? So all of these come with their own pros and cons. Either way, you need to pick your poison. Adjusting the bid out of the gate will almost certainly affect the ad placement. So if you're bidding $5 and you're trying to hit placement four, what do you think happens when you drop $3? Someone behind you is probably uh, bidding four fifty. They'll go into that position. So it makes it very difficult to adjust the bid, right, in terms of this taper off process. So what you can do is start putting back on the daily budget versus decreasing the bid as you may lose the position. At least with the budget caps, your campaign will run in most cases, but you'll lose advertising for the rest of the day after the budget burns through. So the point of the cap is, is that you haven't adjusted the bid. If you haven't adjusted the bid, there's a chance that you're still going to hit the, uh, the position that you desire once you start to dial in, right? But the cap stops you from overspending. And it also, the downside of the cap is that you can only spend so much in the day. And so Amazon might burn through that quickly but it's the less of the two evils. So how about a hybrid version? Twice a day, manually adjust your top of search boost in your campaign. So say you start at 900% and then 12 hours later, you drop it to 0%. And then what you've got to do is dial in to see if it makes economic sense. So you'll play around with these factors, you'll find the sweet spot, and then you'll get your ranking costs under control as you taper off over the six to eight week period. So to bring this into summary, competitive conversion rate and orders matter. It's a must. Don't even bother until you're able to, to dial in this before you spend lots of money. Highly optimized listings, these matter. You must remember that conversion rate is on a continuum, i.e., engagement, add to cart, and clicks, and that a conversion is not a static object. If you're building these uh, campaigns out in a single emotion, one keyword, one ASIN, one campaign, why? Because the top of search reporting, you want to be able to see the data within that without having loads of keywords in the same campaign. You're focused around the ad placement algorithm, yeah? That's your target, because a lot of people don't know, oh, well, I'll spend got 10 grand budget for PPC to rank. But there is no rhyme and reason behind it. And even what we've presented here today, all that's given you is a loose framework. At least you have something to aim at rather than just spraying your target into the air, yeah? So high velocity equals harder to get impressions. Go for midtail keywords based on ad placement position. And then you need to work out how best to taper off for break even. And that amazing covers it. Wow, that so <laughs> very impressive. So if I if I summarize for me, it's like uh, conversion, right? You need to look at uh, building the small wins. That's yeah. the conversion continuum. Like yeah. each you need to like uh, people need to go and look at your products, stay on the page, then add to cart and then probably good engagement and right. dialing in why is that because like if if you've got a load of products right that sold exactly the same amount you can't put them all equally in position number five they have to go so where where does the micro changes come the micro changes come from the negative and the positive labels so which comes down to engagement i mean years ago i mean i did a video in 2000 October 2015, I was one of the first people to realize the correlation or at least recorded it and put it into the public domain. I, I, I demonstrated three products in the UK market and how they affect PPC. And then I'd done those demo, demos. I showed the tracking. I can't remember the tool back then. It was pre even Hevian 10 existed. I don't think they were around when I did it. But that was showing you the correlation. Years ago, you could blast your way to the top. But now you get punished organically if you've got a poor conversion rate. So this is why yeah. your optimization optimization has to be so so much more dialed in now. Yeah, 
I have a we have a question. Uh, how you set your PPC budget against organic orders? What ratio should we adopt? So uh, assume between well, advertised. Here's the thing: there's yeah. a middle ground, and there's always an exception to a rule. So let's just say we as the at the agency, we've got quite a bit of data. We generally find let's just say 15% of your sales are come from PPC. It's quite low. Right. So maybe 25, 30 percent, depending on your total weight cost, is about that area where you're not missing out on sales and you're kind of at the top peak of dialed in. But we it comes dangerous for you as a business is if your PP sales start being 35 to 40, 45 percent ratio of your organic sales, because that will slow you put you out of business if you're not careful. Yeah, but some categories are very like are very advertising driven, right? And it's yeah. like there's an element of, of nearly of saying that the advertising is sort of built in in the cost in the sense that, that you would get some areas where it's very difficult to go below that fifty, like fifty healthy percent, and it's like you see maybe sometimes sixty percent. Like you, like would you agree on that, or do you? You think in any case, it look, be- the thing is, everything has to be treated case by case. I think it's very common for all of us in, in the community can just make assumptions. Um, and let's just say you've got a phenomenal profit line in, in your product. That's going to look, look a lot different to a product that sells twelve ninety nine, and it's costing okay. you three, three and a half dollars a unit or so. Do you see what I mean? It's like you've got less to play with there. But if you've got something there, you've got a very high margin and you're selling something that's, I don't know, $300, but you're getting good regular sales on, that's when it's like, okay, this doesn't matter so much because X, Y, and Z. You know, it's still heavy on cash flow, but there's still maybe a good profit margin there versus a low price product. So it's really a case-by-case basis, but as a rule of thumb, you may be underperforming in PPC and leaving money on the table if you're 10 or 12%. Maybe not. Maybe you're dialed in. But there's ways, you know, you'll find that out over time whilst testing. Uh, and you might find your sweet spot 25, 30. But it starts to get more dangerous on average once you're getting into them 40s, you know. Mm, yeah, no, great insight. And in terms of conversion rate, what, what would you say at what stage? Is there, is there a magic number when you say, okay, what's the it kind varies. of... It varies. I mean, baby could be 8%, 12%, sometimes lower, because there's a lot of people just viewing in there. You know, when, especially, uh, one, you know, zero to 18 months, you've got mums at home, say, or they're on their phone, they've got their baby cradled in their arms. Like, they're not just going to buy anything, Right. They're going to be in there shopping. They'll be looking at everything and they're going to make informed decisions. Why? Because they've just given birth to that child. It's very important that everything that they buy, they're going to be super, what's the word, hyper vigilant, which means they're mm-hmm. going to probably view a lot more products, which obviously higher amount of sessions. And then you're looking at your conversion rate is going to be lower versus a throwaway product in kitchen that costs 10 or 12 bucks, which doesn't, people don't associate as a heavy spend against research because you start getting people start to make more judgments. I think the last data I looked at women was about $25 before they started to dig in a bit when it's no longer a punt to spend money on that. And that's not, that's cross commerce. And I think men were about 28 to $30, but that could be changed since COVID and that will skew the numbers with everyone being at home and having more money. So 30 to 40 percent uh, to be average for us, but CPC is doubled from some. Yeah, it will do. I mean, cost per click has gone through the, the roof, right? It, it simply has. And that's been across the board. And we've all seen it. I've done roundtables with agencies, especially from March this year. You start to see a climb increase of PPC. Uh, unfortunately, this is the state of the market. Generally, there's a higher cost per click across the board. And that will have an impact in your yeah. ratio, right? Because that's obviously... Of course. Uh, Look, imagine if only six months ago, you know, you're, you're converting uh, X percent and then suddenly your cost per click is now doubled. That's just eating up another half again, right? 
that could have a devastating impact on your margin because you could be sailing close to the wind and go, okay, this is a high velocity product, but we're making money. Suddenly that doubles the cost per click. That product's out the market. It's, it, you'll end up giving the product away and you're losing the money per unit based on different ratios of the, the margin versus the, um, the unit price, the landed costs and all the fees. Only takes adjustments of fees or, or issues with like even down to shipping containers now. The costs are going up. So you have to be really careful. So it's very important now to get to a point where you have healthy margins just to sustain this COVID bump and stuff that we're dealing and the way that shipping is in the toilet and issues trying to find a really good free PL and stuff. So people are always hoovering over their, their numbers. But we, even we get people at the agency that um, – think they know their numbers really well and what we do is we provide what's called margin spreadsheets for each individual product landing costs and all their costs goes into that and that's a brand new exercise to lay the data out in a different way and some people go blimey my margin has disappeared i'm glad i did this as an exercise because when i look here and here and here because we pull for apis so we get the data in and close it up and so we're able to dial in the numbers better than just people sitting there doing it manually but some people it catches them by surprise how much their costs have increased you know well and especially with q4 and the cost of containers and, and the it. cost of and all the logistics it's like cpc have increased uh logistics have increased and my, my guess is that a lot of prices will increase probably after Christmas this year. And like 2022 will probably uh, have a shift in, in, in user prices. I think for me, the parting uh, thought maybe is that, okay, margin is super important. Be, being careful about the margin and that it has an impact because you have to advertise to, to boost your ranking. And to be able to advertise, you need to have money. And for yeah. that, you need to be careful about your end user prices. And how much you spend and, and use cleverly or in a clever way um, mm. the advertising. Thank you very much, Danny. It's You're more than welcome. The, we've passed the hour. It's really interesting. Anybody who's, who wants to uh, contact Danny, he's uh, very active on Facebook, on um, on LinkedIn also. We'll send the details and the links in the uh, follow-up emails. Thank you very much, everyone. Good evening for, for the ones in Europe. A good afternoon for the ones in the US. And I'll have the pleasure to have you soon on another show and to have everyone else. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Take Cheers. Bye-bye.